Hello, and welcome to the Edwards Vacuum Laboratory podcast. Today, we're going to provide a general intro introduction to capture pumps and capture pumping technologies. And I'm very fortunate to have a special guest with me to help kind of give us a sneak peek into this type of pumping. So with that, let me introduce to you Dr. Stefan Lausberg. Stefan is the product manager for Gamma Vacuum, and he looks after the Gamma brand of products worldwide. And let me turn it over to Stefan here for a brief introduction of who he is and what makes him tick. Hi, Todd. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for the introduction. And yeah, actually, I've been a product manager for Gamma Vacuum for three years, uh, pretty exactly for three years now. And um, yeah, so my background is um, after school, I first uh, worked a couple of years in a drop forge as an electrician before I started um, studying physics in uh, Heidelberg in southern Germany. So I'm a, a German citizen. And uh, after that, I did my PhD also in physics and usually working with uh, cryogenics and uh, vacuum pumps just as a user. So I had a dilution refrigerator, was working in uh, yeah, solid state physics on quantum criticality, heavy fermion systems, all those type of buzzwords. And uh, after that, I uh, started working in the vacuum business, first years only in application support, so pretty much uh, technical application background. And um, before I got more interested in some to, to work in a more commercial role, that's when I got interested in working for Gamma Vacuum. So, which is a part of the Atlas Copco group, and uh, we are uh, so me and my fellow product managers are working in the scientific vacuum division. So, they're product managers, for example, for the next uh, turbo pumps or uh, EDX pumps from Edwards, and uh, I focus on uh, gamma vacuum in that respect. Very good, very good. Well, that's a big enough product line there to uh, you handle a little, a little bit of everything. Your background with some electronics in there, and also with the pumping technologies, and we definitely combine that all together. Yeah, and uh, I like that very much. So we have a broad uh, product range uh, with Gamma. So Gamma Vacuum itself is uh, located in uh, Shakopee in Minnesota. So uh, I would call it the suburb of uh, Minneapolis, if if you don't mind. And right. um, so, uh, I mean, Gamma Vacuum is uh, quite a peculiar uh, company. It has like around about 40 employees. Uh, so that's uh, rather small in the Atlas Copco group. And that's why it's even more fascinating to have such a big uh, product range uh, from, from iron pumps, controllers. We even make our own cables, neck pumps, titanium sublimation pumps. And uh, that's, that's the fun in it. And we have a broad level in customization. Just turned 20 years uh, old. Like two weeks ago, we had a celebration in uh, Shakopee, and um, yeah, that's uh, what I what I enjoyed a lot. Very good. Well, ha happy birthday to Gamma! Happy anniversary! I take that. Thank yeah. you for Gamma. Yeah. <laughs> and and so the Gamma name, Gamma as a company, has been around for about 20 years. But the uh, the expertise and the uh, you know Gamma has been playing, and a lot of the team members from Gamma have been playing with iron pumps for quite a few years longer than that, right? Uh, the iron pump technology really goes back to the early 1960s, I believe. Yeah, that's right, Todd. And uh, even some of our employees uh, have been in the same company for the last 40 or almost 40 years, and um, yeah, have even been in the pre, um, uh, pre predecessors of uh, Gamma Vacuum and uh, still there. So uh, lots of history, lots of knowledge around and um, yeah, a lot of knowledgeable um, colleagues uh, that can make the difference to this brand. Right, right. So when you see iron pumps out in the world today, a lot of them you'll see from the last 20 years with the Gamma Vacuum name on there. But prior to that, you'll see different name plates on some of our iron pumps, including physical electronics or phi um, prior to that we were part of the perkin elmer group so you'll see some of those those pumps out there and i've seen quite a few and then if you go way back into the 1960s and in throughout the 70s you'll see uh, many of them with the Alltech name on those and then they're typically kind of a bright blue looking iron pump um, see some of those out with our friends in california for sure um, so really the history, even though 20, even though Gamma Vacuum is about 20 years old, the history and the technology is much, much older than that. And the, the group as a whole has been playing with iron pumps for a long time. Yeah, and it's fascinating to still see those pumps in the field. And I mean, especially as they work in ultra high vacuum regime, uh, they don't really wear off. So um, 
basically, depending on the pressure range they're working, they could be operating until next ice age or so. Um, it's <laughs> more a challenge of the uh, the electronics. So uh, electronics failed every now and then. So after a couple of decades, they they start failing, and um, then uh, you need to replace those. But in many cases, you can keep the iron pumps for a very long time. Sure, sure. So with all those company changes, there's been a lot of different things done with all the different groups, whether it's Phi or Perkin Elmer or even Altec back in there. But but really, the the focus for Gamma Vacuum today is capture pumps and controllers to, to control and operate these capture pumps and maybe some auxiliary pumping to go along with it and other devices in there. So maybe this would be a good time. You know, let's let's from a high level. What what is a capture pump, right? There's a lot of people that really don't know this terminology. Um, yeah. What makes the capture pump a capture pump, and why is this, or how is this different from other pumping technologies in the world? That's a that's a really good question. And uh, so usually when I introduce uh, ion pumps or gamma products to someone, I start with uh, the difference between gas capture pumps and gas transfer pumps, because in general you can divide any vacuum pump into one of those two groups. And um, so yeah like gas transfer pumps is easy to understand because it works just like the pump for your pool in the garden. You transfer some uh, some fluids from, from A to B. And um, so you have some, uh, some inlet, you have some exhaust. And in general, you can say a capture pump is something without an exhaust. So you store the gases somehow inside of the pump. And that's true, for example, for uh, cryo vacuum pumps that just uh, uh, keep gases in in terms of uh, cryo pumping or cryo absorption and uh, iron pumps on the other hand they um, work at room temperature so you don't usually need those uh, necessarily need these low temperatures to keep in the gases you uh, iron pumps um, work with ionization on uh, residual gases that would come from inside the vacuum chamber so you ionize the residual gas Part of it would uh, be trapped inside the cathode sheets, so they would just be buried inside uh, part of the material. Uh, another fraction of the gas sputters off titanium in those uh, pumps and create some fresh gutter layers that would absorb residual gases. So they would actually uh, trap um, reactive gases like oxygen or nitrogen in those gutter layers and um, but especially it's interesting for capturing hydrogen. So hydrogen would actually diffuse into those uh, getter layers and um, hydrogen is especially important in ultra high vacuum because it's most of the gas you would find at pressures below 10 to the minus seven torr. And um, that's why ion pumps are really giving a benefit to your application. And we also have some other pumps uh, other pump uh, mechanisms like uh, neck pumps or titanium sublimation pumps to um, to uh, actually pump uh, hydrogen at low pressures. Sure, and do some complementary stuff. And we'll, we'll talk about each of those in a little bit of detail here. But um, yeah, a couple of things on the capture pumps. It's, it, it's interesting. I know some people refer to them as permanent capture pumps. And you know, that term can be used loosely with some of them. You know, in the case of a an ion pump, yes, we're turning gases into solids and we're we're capturing them somehow, like you said, either in the cathode plates or burying those in other places with titanium and, and turning a gas into a solid. And it's a little bit more of a permanent capture. Um, TSPs kind of work the same way, and we'll talk about that. NEGs and cryos, as you mentioned, those kind of temporarily capture some gases, maybe permanently capture others, and then there's some level of a regeneration process that releases some of them while it captures others. So maybe not completely permanent all the way through, but uh, you know, in general, just calling them capture pumps. Yeah, they're uh, your, 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 uh, your definition there or your description of capturing something and holding on to it versus bringing it in, compressing it and exhausting out the other end of the pump is, uh, is, is a great uh, way to look at it. Um, you know, and one of the benefits of this with all of that, since we're not bringing in gases and compressing them and pushing them out another side, we are kind of more capturing them. They, uh, they're they a pretty long lived pump out there as well, right? These pumps can uh, reside and you, you touched on that a little bit earlier. They can, they can reside out in the field for many years because there are no moving parts and there's no real regular maintenance that happens with these. There's no bearings, there's no tip seals, there's no oils or fluids to change out. 
they just run. And uh, all captured pumps can run longer the deeper the vacuum level, right? The less gases they're encountering, the less gases they're sputtering or, or capturing, uh, the longer they can run without any uh, outside uh, maintenance needed, and, and and I guess not really maintenance, but intervention, if you will. Um, yeah, that's right. Because I mean, the the lower you go in pressure, the less gas is there, and uh, the lower will be the so-called ion current that um, that creates this sputtering uh, eventually, and um, so therefore you have less wear the lower you go into pressure, and that's why you increase the lifetime the lower you go in pressure, and. Uh, one interesting part, as you say, like we're not pushing gases uh, from uh, from the inlet to the exhaust. We don't actually have any moving parts inside iron pumps, and that's uh, why we have a lack of vibrations. So, or like, let's put it in a positive way, we don't have vibrations, and that's especially interesting for applications where customers are concerned about a higher level of vibration. So, like electron microscopes, for example, uh, when they are looking at fine structures and um, yeah, in uh, like nanometer large structures, or which is also important in manufacturing for uh, semiconductors when they are testing uh, their circuits or when they are writing the semiconductor masks. So you don't want to have any vibrations when you're doing this fine uh, type of um, yeah uh, manufacturing, and that's. Uh, that's where they really show their benefit. Excellent, excellent. Very good. Well, we've touched on a little bit of a couple of these here, but maybe let's take again a little bit of a higher higher overview here. But let's let's dive into uh, ion pump specifically. And the ion pump, what most people call an ion pump, also the, and it also goes by many other names in the world, and some of it's regional and some of it's based on industry. But the ion pump can be called an ion getter pump or a sputter ion pump or multiple combinations of those two, but generically I refer to them as ion pumps and I'm gonna talk about just ion pumps right. in this, in this uh, uh, you know, podcast that we have here. Um, but the ion pump technology, let's talk about this, it's probably mo the most well-known or, or widely used capture pump in the world. Um, and it actually has all, the most history out of all of them out there as well. Uh, the origins going back into say the 1930s, uh, right. with the origin of the penning cell itself. And it was really identified as a result of a, a, a gauge, right? That, that's right. And I mean, the penning cell was invented, I think, in 1937, as you say. And uh, so it's basically the concept um, of a cold cathode gauge. And many people are uh, familiar with that concept. So you have one anode ring, you have some cathode sheets around that. And uh, actually it was pretty early found out that you can uh, not only measure the pressure at low uh, low pressures with this type of gauge, you can actually improve the pressure because I think it was an incident at some point that people forgot to uh, to turn on the uh, high vacuum pump. Could only be uh, a diffusion pump at that time, so no turbo pumps, no uh, cryo pumps around. And then they saw still if you only kept the uh, cold cathode gauge on, you would uh, create a lower pressure with it alone and so that that when uh, was found out that those cold cathode gauges actually have a finite pumping speed and so um, some some tweaks around that and just putting a couple of uh, cold cathode gauges into parallel turned out into the first iron pump i think some point in the 1950s or so and uh yeah and now we're here with a product portfolio ranging from uh like 0.2 liters per second up to 1200 liters per second for really large iron pumps. Amazing, amazing. You know, you look back at some of that, you know, kind of the commercialization of the iron pump really in about the 1950s. You know, our work started in the 1960s and throughout. And you look at a lot of that stuff. And on one hand, you can look at the inside of an iron pump and there really hasn't been a whole lot that's changed much on how it runs. There's been some optimization and some material changes and whatnot. Um, it's just amazing a technology dating back that far still in use today and still doing such a phenomenal job in pumping at uh, UHV and XHV. Yeah, uh, right. Almost 100 years, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. So, 
Yeah, so there's a lot of different things. And again, a future podcast, we'll get into specifics on uh, insides of the ion pump. What kind of pumping elements can you put inside? Are they positive polarity or negative polarity? What gases specifically are we trying to go at? Maybe what, what pressure range we're planning on working in? Those are all factors that come into uh, you know uh, making the choice of, of what internals do I put inside of an ion pump? Um, but I think Gamma Vacuum has done a great job of uh, not only creating a lot of different sizes, uh, but also footprints of ion pumps to fit, you know, w within uh, just about any application that uh, you can encounter out in the world. Right, very, right, yeah. Very good stuff. So uh, some other pumping technologies in, in the capture pump line that complement ion pumps. Now they can be used as standalone as well, but many times they're complementary. Uh, the first one I want to touch on here is a, a titanium sublimation pump, sometimes referred to as just a TSP. Um, so TSP, uh, again, I, I know of several customers that are using these as a standalone pumping device, uh, but many times they are coupled together inside of an ion pump or alongside of an ion pump. Um, why would somebody add a TSP to an ion pump? What, what, what would be the benefit of having two technologies working together like that? I guess, I guess you're right. I think most customers would use an ion pump in combination uh, with the TSP pump because, <clears throat> as I said earlier, the main gas you need to worry about in ultra high vacuum is hydrogen. And uh, what TSPs and also neck pumps, we come back to that later, uh, do is they give some uh, additional pumping speed into hydrogen. So it's not that much uh, pumping speed of oxygen or nitrogen they're providing. They're especially providing uh, pumping speed for hydrogen. And that's why it's a good, um, good match uh, to like, to pimp your iron pump in that respect to give a little bit more hydrogen pumping speed to them. For example, if you're looking at a uh, 800 liters per second uh, iron pump, you're looking at 800 liters per second for nitrogen at 10 to the minus six ore. But uh, if you wanted to know the approximate pumping speed for hydrogen of this pump, you have something roundabout by rule of thumb of 1200 liters per second. But if you added um, a TSP pump, including, um, for example, this uh, cryo shroud to it, eight inch cryo shroud, you would end up with an additional hydrogen pumping speed of uh, 12,000 uh, liters per second if you're operating at cryogenic temperatures, uh, this uh, cryogenic shield and uh, that's quite a difference so 1200 liters per second for hydrogen for this pump and then you can easily add uh, 12,000 liters per second uh, for hydrogen so that that makes quite a difference and uh, it actually fits better to the gas mixture you're having at uh, low pressure so you would say you have like 99 percent uh, um, of hydrogen gas in ultra high vacuum, and the rest is just 1% contains everything else. So argon, uh, water vapor, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. So uh, still you need some pumping speed for those gases, and that's where the, uh, the ion pump comes into play because uh, TSP pumps are not good in uh, pumping nitrogen and so on. So if you just added uh, hydrogen pumping speed, you would see after some time that nitrogen would come up, argon would come up, eventually spoil uh, your vacuum level. You would end up at 10 to the minus 6, minus 7 uh, millibar, and you wouldn't know why, because you have such a large pumping speed for hydrogen. But still, you need a little bit of pumping speed for, um, for nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. And that's why the combination is a good thing. Sure, sure. And, and, and there's a term that uh, we'll touch on in both with the titanium sublimation pump as well as the non-evaporable getter or NEG um, called boost the vac and uh, mm -hmm. combining the technologies to boost the vacuum performance. And, and that's really where that, uh, that term came from. Um, and the other thing in there <clears throat> that I'd like to mention is both with the TSP and the NEG that we'll get to, those, those pumping technologies, while they may have great hydrogen pumping speed and, and, and handle some other gases as well, kind of largely the reactive gases, neither of those pumping technologies will handle noble gases. So That's many right. Times That's a good point. Many times when people combine a TSP or a NEG with an ion pump, it's kind of a nice one-two punch. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details here, but with an ion pump, if you grab a noble diode or even a triode element inside, something that can handle the noble gases 
and remain stable in the presence of noble gases over time, combining a TSP or a NEG is really a great one-two punch. You get the great hydrogen pumping speed, the ion pump has the pumping speed for some of the other gases as well as noble gases and give you more of a complete pumping package should you need that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a good point to bring up noble gases because, uh, yeah, if you just had TSPs or neck pumps installed, you would see after some time how those gases come up. If you have an RGA installed, for example, a residual gas analyzer, we can discriminate the different types of gases. And uh, another gas type is interesting, which wouldn't be pumped by TSPs and necks, is uh, methane. And uh, methane can be formed just by the carbon from the steel from the chamber walls, uh, along with hydrogen that's always present in ultra high vacuum. So they would form at some point in the chamber walls, eventually ruining uh, your vacuum. And for those type of gases, you uh, really need to have some iron pump uh, pumping speed inside. Right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Introduction to a TSP. That's excellent. Now, a non-evaporable getter, maybe a little bit newer, right? The TSPs have been used for easily going back into the 1970s and, and maybe earlier than that. In general, the concept has been around for quite some time. A little bit newer technology that has been used for quite some time, but in vacuum, it's gonna, I'm going to call it newer relative to these other technologies, is a mm -hmm. non-evaporable getter or a NEG. And uh, these are these are many times used a lot more than a TSP as a standalone, but they're also combined with a with an ion pump many times as well for the boost of ac, if you will. Um, but a non evaporable getter works quite a bit different than a TSP, right? That's right. I mean, the uh, actually the performance is quite similar because uh, they're pumping both hydrogen, they're both pumping no noble gases or methane. Uh, but the way they work is quite uh, different. So while the titanium sublimation pump sublimates something, uh, the neck doesn't evaporate anything because it's called the non-evaporable getter pump. And it will um, work in principle um, like a sponge. So that's uh, the easy picture. You can always look at a, a sponge that is uh, saturated with water. And if you want to continue, um, yeah, absorbing some water with it you need to squeeze it out and that's what you do uh, with a neck pump as well so you can consider neck pump as a kind of a metal sponge so with uh, really microscopic holes in it and um, there are basically two mechanisms taking place in neck pump one is uh, that hydrogen can actually diffuse into the, the bulk of the the sponge material and uh, while other gases like oxygen, nitrogen, and so on, they can form some type of uh, chemical um, materials on the, uh, on the surface, on the inner surface of this metal sponge. And that's uh, basically the two pumping mechanisms we're having here. Um, the squeezing of the sponge uh, does not work with uh, mechanical Force, but you need to just to heat up the neck material. Actually, usually you're using an electrical heater for that. And uh, while you're heating it up, it would get rid of or it would expel the hydrogen gas uh, from the bulk of this metal sponge. At that time, you would need a turbo pump system to get rid of uh, basically hydrogen coming out of the neck pump. And um, yeah, but at some point you would. Um, have it emptied and uh, you can let it cool down again and then you would have you could start again with an empty regenerated uh, neck pump and uh, which would be uh, would would again provide some pumping speed for hydrogen excellent excellent i like that and that's kind of a good a good uh, overview or kind of a general uh, view of what these are right a, a non evaporable get a non evaporable getter or a neg pump it's kind of like a sponge a vacuum sponge in the system in the sense that it works a metal sponge um and the titanium sublimation pump is almost like kind of like a, a lint roller or a fly trap right we got a surface out there that captures the gases and they stick to that surface and then uh, ultimately when that surface is uh, saturated, you sublimate a fresh layer on top of it. So um, yeah. It, yeah. it reminds me to, to Renaissance, Renaissance uh, cosmetics. If you know that like uh, that, that what I was, was told it's cool, like the, uh, the baronesses and kings and queens of the past, they wouldn't 
take a shower too often, they would just uh, put another layer of cosmetics uh, <laughs> on the old one. So that's, yeah, that's my, my image I have. There you go. There you go. Nice color added there. I like it. So that's, uh, you know, it's all of those, you know, right? Using the iron pump here with either the TSP or the non-evaporable getter. We'll just call that largely the, the boost to back. And we talked about that. And, uh, and again, many times we see the, the combination of those pumps in the uh, in the real world or in the pumping world if you will um the other type of capture pump that uh, i'm not going to spend too much time on today or i, I don't want to spend too much time on today but uh it falls definitely into this family as well is is the cryo pump right um now there is a little cryo pumping happening with our tsp when that's installed with a liquid cryo shroud inside of an ion pump um that can be cooled with ambient water uh, but more commonly it's done with liquid nitrogen which is uh, you know, cryo pump type temperatures. Uh, and in that case, it's doing a couple things. It's cooling all surfaces and making the uh, sublimated titanium a little bit more sticky to get our gases a little bit better. But it's also turning the other exterior surfaces of that shroud into a cryo pump. So you can get some, uh, you know, H2O or some water pumping as well as some other gases. So uh, in a sense, uh, the TSP with a liquid cryo shroud is a cryo pump. But cryo pumps in general are a much bigger field. Um, definitely would like to spend a whole nother topic on this. And and Stefan, you have a, a big history in cryo pumping in general, correct? That's uh, that's right. That that's what I was working on in application support for a couple of years um, in vacuum business. And uh, I mean, for TSPs, uh, when we're having this liquid cryo shroud, usually it it works with liquid nitrogen. So the customer supplies it with liquid nitrogen. So you will have a temperature of uh, 77 Kelvin. And that temperature is just fine to pump uh, yeah, any water that's around to a very low uh, saturation vapor pressure. And uh, But it's only true for, um, for water vapor. But the different effect you just mentioned is it makes the titanium more uh, yeah, sticky, more accessible for uh, hydrogen. That's also true. You can improve the hydrogen pumping speed as you're using titanium. But uh, yeah, basically cryo pumps usually work with uh, so with a dry uh, type of technology using some, some cold head inside with different temperature stages, activated charcoal. So you could uh, basically pump all the different uh, gases with a cryo pump. But the big drawback of a cryo pump is the huge vibration that it comes with. So uh, you have usually a cold head inside, a pneumatically driven cold head that would uh, generate sudden vibrations much bigger than you would have with turbo molecular pumps. And uh, that's again the big benefit for uh, for uh, ion pumps, or also titanium sublimation pumps with the liquid cryo shroud. You just have a little tiny amount of vibrations you're getting in just because of the flow of the nitrogen, which is really uh, some some low type of uh, vibration. That's basically the the difference between these types of pumps. But you're right. I mean, cryo pumps deserves uh, its own session. I would say. For sure, for sure. I think we can probably have a few in there. Uh, we've chatted about those over the over the years. Um, so good, no, good overview overview of all capture pumps, but specifically kind of with the ion pumps, TSPs, and NEGs here. You know. What are, what are some of the typical uses and applications? And we've talked about a few of them, right? Because they have no moving parts, no vibration, or, or virtually no vibration, right? There is an electrical signal involved to some degree, so you could say that there is a little vibration in there. But largely speaking, there's no vibration with a capture pump. Um, what, right. what, what do you you know? What are the typical uses and applications, right? We touched on scanning electron microscopes or anybody doing high resolution imaging. Right. Um, I mean, need... electron microscopes is, is basically the biggest OEM type of business for uh, for ion pumps because of the lack of vibration. That's uh, that's their benefit in this application. But there are also other applications like uh, in synchrotrons, uh, accelerators, uh, particle accelerators, because accelerators they first of all require a very low uh, vacuum, so deep into the ultra high vacuum level. And then they're also uh, submitting uh, radiation, lots of radioactive radiation. And that's not something um, pumps in general are good for. Uh, it's, it's not a good environment for pumps and uh, especially not for electronics. And that's um, 
that's usually no issue for iron pumps. Iron pumps have no moving parts inside, no oil. You can make the cables really long until they reach any type of electronics, and that's why they're really useful in these type of applications. Um, sure. Yeah, in general, in radiation environments, in hot environments, in environments where you require a really low uh, ultra high vacuum pressure level, that's uh, that's good vibra- um, applications for iron pumps. Also, oh. for example, X-ray. I mean, X-ray is another type of uh, radioactive radiation. Uh, that's where iron pumps are often used, like for X-ray tubes, for for really a lot of different applications, from uh, yeah, blood bags, sterilization to uh, uh, electric circuit test testing, and uh, so many electronics are tested just under under X-ray um, um, sources, just to check if there are any faults in wafers and in uh, and structures. And um, that's that's basically it. Also, some other interesting X-ray applications, like in uh, airport scanners, where you put your your bag through when you're in that, an airport before you enter an airplane. That's uh, where you would use X-rays, and uh, that's also a place where iron pumps are used. Very good, right, right. And 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 with to kind of further expand on the accelerators, you have not only the big part, particle accelerators and synchrotrons of the world, um, but another kind of unfortunate uh, market that is that is very well needed is uh, oncology. And a lot of the oncology tools today have a lot of uh, particle accelerators, whether it's a photon or proton or other types of uh, energies being excited and, and used for that imaging and treatment of cancer. Right. Um, I mean, it, for basically for any type of, uh, of X-ray source, you need ultra high vacuum. Some are just especially like if you're looking at those imaging x-ray sources they're okay just with an internal non-evaporable getter and they will be closed uh, for for all their lifetime but especially when it comes to treatment to to larger sources of x-rays you need an active uh, pumping there and that's where where iron pumps are uh, used a lot and they use actually also for those ct scanner treatment machines and uh, but also just just normal treatment machines and but also uh, as you say for um, particle accelerators like heavy ion uh, therapy you need for just a local destruction of uh, cancer tissue and uh, that's that's also uh, where ion pumps are used and that's also really I mean that's that's easy to understand for everyone why uh, this type of pump is quite uh, beneficial for applications. So everyone should have an iron pump, right? I mean, I, I remember a, I remember an associate from many years ago that uh, said he was going to keep working on iron pumps and selling iron pumps until there was one iron pump in every house in, in the world, right? Um, maybe maybe a l- little bit extreme there, but uh, yeah, there's a, there's quite a few applications for iron pumps and, and capture pumps to support them of, of different types. Very right. cool. Very cool, and we get we get to see lots of very cool applications as we travel around and see very many, you know, quite a few different applications, installations, and uses of capture pumps uh, in the world. Very exciting. That's definitely true. Yeah. Well, very good, very good. I think that is uh, more than just a general overview. We started to kind of actually peel the onion back there just a little bit, but uh, very exciting. I think that's. Uh, a, a good interview, a good overview into the different types of technologies that uh, that we get to play with on a daily basis. Um, I do look forward to uh, uh, sometime down the road uh, having future podcasts and specifically diving into the different technologies a little bit deeper for some of the people that we uh, maybe just wet their appetite here a little bit and they want to learn a little bit more about why, where, how, and when an unevaporable getter would be a beneficial pump for them. Um, so I think we could do that. It was great to to be here, Todd. It was uh, really a pleasure talking to you about that. And um, yeah, well, very good. Well, very good. Well, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time, Stefan. Uh, very, you're a very busy man. You have lots of things going on, and I appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me for a little while here. Um, and to everybody else, stay tuned to the uh, Edwards Vacuum Laboratory Talk podcast channel for future episodes on other types of capture pumps as well as all things vacuum. And uh, as always, if there's something you're looking for, uh, please let us know, drop us a line, and uh, maybe we can have a future podcast uh, address your needs. Thank you very much. And Stefan, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Todd. All right.